Welcome to part two of the price adjustment side with Scoop. This week we'll be going through the discounted players based on last year's average and see if we can find a little bit more value after looking last week at the people who are overpriced in the system like Josh Schuster's Tom Travojevic's based on last year's averages. Now, unfortunately there aren't as many, so I'll be going through each individual one giving my thoughts. But one of the most important things to note about these discounted players is that they're either discounted because A, they were injured in a couple of games and didn't play very many games, or B, they were fringe players and just didn't play many games anyway. So some of these prices are a little bit cheaper to reflect the fact that these averages might not be an accurate reflection of how they will actually score. They might be a little bit unsustainable. For example, the most discounted guy who averaged 41 last year in, I think, two or three games. He should be priced at just under 600k based on that 41 average, but they put him at about 319k, which is quite a lot of value. But this year, make a Sebo's back and fit, and there's a much more difficult eel straw to start the year. I think they play like four of the top four teams in the first six weeks or so, so tough for the outside backs. Whereas last year, he probably got lucky, scored a couple of tries in softer games before he went out of the team with that rib injury. So I wouldn't expect someone like Sean Russell to be much value unless there was a bunch of injuries at the Eels and he got another shot. At this price, he's probably a good shout to do well, but he's, I doubt he's got 260k of value in him. The second one is I'm a little bit more interested in, and as you can see, I've put this in yellow as somebody who I think is a possibility to start, but not a certainty. These orange ones I put as pretty, like, pretty likely to stay in the reserves or not very likely to start unless there's a lot of injuries in the team. Back to Isaac Thompson. He played a few games at the back end of last year on the wing, and with Tane Milne suspended to start 2023 for two weeks, Thompson has first crack at the wing spot at Souths, now, Souths have a pretty rough draw like the Eels to start the year, but they've really turned into a, an attacking dynamo at the back end of last year with Latrell firing, and I think Isaac Thompson can do pretty well if he manages to hang on to that spot with Tane Milne back. Now, I would say he probably holds on to that spot, but I don't have any guarantees for that, and if you don't like that risk, well, it's easy to look elsewhere. Christian Mapapalangi, He's a chance, apparently, of ousting either Best or Gagai in the night centres and starting next year. I possibly should have him in the yellow, um, but I put him in the orange when I made this list. Both he and Isaac Thompson would probably be pretty good value if they started the year. And as you can see, he had a couple of shots last year and ended up with a 40 average. With the Knights' really easy opening six weeks, I would say if he starts, he's a really good bring-in and is a little bit more likely than Sean Russell or maybe Isaac Thompson to get closer to this value. I don't think he'll get 250k of value, but I would say he'll be a really good shot at maybe 150, 200k if he gets that spot. Zach Hosking from the Panthers, he's been signed for the Broncos. I would say he or Garner is likely to replace Kickout in the Panthers lineup at second row. Both Garner and Zach Hosking would be very, very good buyers no matter who starts but I would say Garner has the advantage at this stage. However, Hosking had a very, very good average at second row at the Broncos last year, and I think this 49.8 average even includes a limited minutes game off the bench. So technically, he might even have a little bit more value than this in a really good attacking Panthers team if he actually starts. So want to keep an eye on for team lists. Lachlan Miller. Now, Lachlan Miller had a couple of stints at fullback at the Sharks at the back end of last year and scored really, really well. He's very quick and provides a lot of threats around the park. And there is word that he might be going to the Knights. I think just today he's officially requested a release from Cronulla so that he can sign from, with the Knights. If he signs with the Knights, I would say he's almost a must-have in your team and fixes a lot of wing fullback problems, given that his 2022 20, average was 44, and I think his fullback average was 49. And even though the Knights are arguably a fair bit of a downgrade from the Sharks, that's still 20 points of value on his 30 price points. 
and I would say you can make at least 10 to 15 points of value out of that 20, even at the Knights. Dean Hawkins, I don't think he's going to be very relevant. He's behind Lachlan Ilias, and unless there's a big injury that either Ilias or Walker has, I think he'll stay in the reserves and won't do much. But if he gets a shot, there's a bit of potential value in him. And although he only had a couple of games, this average might be a little bit more reliable because halves have a little bit higher base than some of the outside backs, like centers or wingers, who rely more on tackle busts and tries. Hawkins has some kicking, as do most halves, and I think he'd probably be a good buy if he was in, but at this stage, he won't start the year. Matt Ikuvalu, another Sharks outside back who could provide some value. Now, he's behind... Ronaldo Mulitalo and Sione Katoa as the Sharks gun wingers. But as you might remember in 2021, he was a cracking try scorer for the Roosters. And potentially, I think he could go close to being a keeper if he ended up in that Sharks team at any stage. His average last year when he got a couple of games was almost 40, which is not quite, but starting to head towards keeper territory for wing fullback. And I think he's probably... Given his proven track record at wing over the last few years, I think he's actually quite a safe amount of value if he gets that starting spot. Ronald Voltman at the Warriors. He's one of the halves there who are pushing to start to begin next year. I think Andrew Webster has said he wants Sean Johnson at 7, Tamari Martin at 6, and um, Nicole Klockstad at 1. However, if that changes and someone like Voltman gets a run, I think he's very good value like Dean Hawkins, same price too actually. As a halfback, he'll be a lot higher in base than some of the outside backs and could be some good value. Deluise Hota, or however you pronounce that last name, a centre for the Brisbane Broncos. I think from memory he has a really good try scoring and attacking record, especially in um, Q Cup. I think he'd be a good bring in if he ends up getting a spot, but that'd probably mean Farnworth, who's had a cracking Cracking World Cup and finished to last year before he got injured. I'd say he'll be a really nice buy if he can get that spot, but he's behind Stags and Farnworth at the moment. Cooper Johns, he's just signed with the Sea Eagles in this preseason. I'd say he's probably a decent amount of value as another cheap half. He's behind Schuster and DC at the moment, so as it stands, he won't play, but later in the year, if some injuries happen, he might get a shot. Jed Cartwright. Rabbitohs, I think he can play both centre and second row. Could be a shout to be some value next year. Priced at 26, even though his average was 33 last year. That's 7 points of value. If he ends up starting at second row for a good amount of time, I would expect him to score higher than 33, given that he's a second rower. But we just have to wait and see what happens. I think Junior Tupo is... Probably a little bit further down the ranks in the Tigers outside backs, but he had a couple of shots last year, and with those few games, they've discounted his price a little bit. So one to just keep an eye on. Kay Dykes, now that Miller is requesting release from Cronulla Sharks, I would say he's first in line behind Will Kennedy if he goes down. And Luke Metcalf is probably the first in line to be either a half spot or the fullback spot for the Warriors if CNK or Tamara Martin or Sean Johnson goes down. And I would say Luke Metcalf actually probably scores a lot better than 27, given his attacking prowess. Declan Casey, I think he's a little bit more likely to start than some of these other guys. A good shot at being one of the Bulldogs' centers come round one. It'll probably be one of the three of Casey, Alamotti, and Skelton, now that Aaron Shoup has moved to the Titans, I think. And at 277k, that's basically base price. I'd hop on him if he manages to start. Dane Mariner, another Broncos center who's behind Stags at Farnworth. I would say Hoeta is a little bit ahead of him, but he's also a tiny bit discounted. I'd prefer Hoeta from memory. I think he's got better stats than Mariner, but I can't I can't remember off the top of my head. A little bit discounted. Now, finally, we get down to these two green ones, and these two are the only two in the entire competition who are discounted for no real reason and, well, very likely to start. Jojo Fafita and Greg Marsview both played 
I think they played like eight games and 17 games respectively. They might be slightly discounted because of the teams they're in. I'm not sure, especially Mars Hugh. I guess maybe they thought moving from the Titans to the Knights is a bit of a downgrade, and so they priced him just a fraction cheaper than his average. I was a little bit keen on Mars Hugh to start the year, but I think he just needs way too many tries in order to be relevant, and a starting winger at over 500k, I wouldn't touch them unless their name is someone like Taylor May or Brian Toto, and even then, probably not a go. So that's all of those discounted players, as I was saying. These guys, I think all of the value that they've got there, like 3k, 2k, is mostly just down to rounding errors with how I've calculated it. You can see Nico Hines. If, if you wanted some more argument for Nico Hines, technically he's 3k underpriced, so go your hardest. But all of the rest of these guys, as you can see, they're pretty much all at price. The other two I wanted to talk about before we finish up with this and then go and have a look at the buy looping are uh, Hopgood and Jack Hetherington. Hopgood has moved from the Panthers to the Eels, but he only played four games. So technically, he should be a little bit discounted. But because of that bigger role that they expect him to play at the Eels, they have priced him basically at his average, which is a little unfortunate because I would have really loved about a 400k Hopgood instead of a 450k, but he's still good value as it stands. Jack Hetherington, he'll be one of the main candidates to fill... Mitch Barnett's vacant second row spot, but there's a good chance that either Fitzgibbon or Brody Jones will get that. We just have to see how it goes TLT. He played three games, so probably even more likely to get discounted than Hopgood, but unfortunately, because they noticed that and they thought he's a good chance to start, he's also stayed at his price um, and is matched at what his average was last year, so 28.9 versus 28.9 price point. All right, so as we saw last week, there are a lot of very, very popular players who you'll probably want in your team that'll really hurt the value and the strength of your final round one team. So if you've got guys like a Tom Travojevic, a Josh Schuster, a Nathan Cleary, and a Brandon Smith, you're already 400k behind where you thought you were going to be preseason because they've increased their price 50k, 60k, 100k, and 215k. I really wish they hadn't done that, because Josh Schuster would have been a really, really good value with all those interchange games last year, but it is what it is. So, in order to make up a little bit of that deficit, I'll now show you a bit about looping. Looping can be a bit of a, a, bit of a nightmare if you're not used to it, especially in years where there aren't many buys, but this year... We are due to have one buy every week. And so if you have a player from that team, so let's go for round one and the Dragons have the buy. If you have a player from the Dragons who have the buy, you can treat them as a player who doesn't play and then loop around that player to see if you can maximize your potential scoring. I'll show you how that works. So I have Sloan in my wing fullback spot at the moment as it stands. Now... If I pick two players who can play wing fullback, I can have a look to see which one of them goes first and whether I like that person's score. So the two wing fullbacks that I have on my bench are Timari Martin, who has the wing fullback duel along with the half, and Tommy Talao from the Tigers, who's a chance of getting a center spot. Now, out of these two, I'm pretty sure Tamara Martin plays first. So yeah, the Warriors play the second game of the week, so Martin will score before Tommy Talao. Now, let's say the Warriors have a shocker, and the Knights are a really improved team with their signings, and Tamara Martin only scores, say, 15 for some reason. Now, if I don't want to get Martin's 15 subbed in for Sloan because he doesn't play, I can put Talao above him, and because Talao is ranked higher on the bench, he will sub in first because he's ranked five and Martin is ranked six, essentially. Talao will then act like he subs in for Sloan and my scoring will actually act like this. So I'll have 17, including Talao, in there. Now, because in this current arrangement, both Martin and Talao are my emergencies and don't score, I can add a little bit to this loop and make it a little bit more complicated. 
say that I wanted to test just in case Matt Dury scored pretty badly. Now, he's a second rower looking like he'll get first crack at the vacant spot left by Isaiah Papali'i, but he hasn't got a great PPM. Just suppose that he doesn't score really well, and I just want to check how he goes. Instead of doing that, because he plays first out of all these three people, I can put Sloan back on my bench and put one of Talal Martin, it doesn't matter because they won't play yet, and I can put him above Dury. Now, if Dury plays really, really badly and he scores, say, a 15 or a 20 um, before Tamara Martin and such have even played, I can make sure that I don't get that score by just playing Martin and somebody else above him and keeping Sloan in my emergencies and there's nobody to sub, so Dury doesn't score in. But if he does score well, like really, really well, and I think I really want Dury's score, and I'm going to risk a bad score from Martin or Talau because I really want Dury's good score, say for a 250 basement, he got 45, for example, that'd be pretty much worth subbing in at that price point. I could then leave, to, um, I could leave Sloan on my bench here and Dury would act like he subs in for him when the rest of the round comes along and Sloan doesn't play. So there's a couple of different ways that you can use the buy loopers this year because they don't play at all. They do not lock until the end of the round and you don't need to worry about their order. I've just rearranged my team temporarily so I can show you how this works. Say for some reason you had three dragons to start the year, which I would not recommend because you can't find out for sure what their teams are going to line up in for round two. But say a bit later on, if you've got three knights like Ponga, Miller, if he signs, and Hastings, you could do something like this. So if you've got quite a lot of the buy players, you can then really try and get three of the best four of these potential scores. You order them in the games that they're going to play. So I've got Dury, Martins, Sonny Luke, and Thompson, because you've got Eels, Warriors, Panthers, and then Rabbitohs down here. So let's just run through a couple of scenarios here. If Dury scores 40, that's a good score for a cheap guy. I would leave him there and he would sub in after that first game. Well, it would act like he subs in for one of the Dragons players. So that's all good. Now, Tamara Martin. Let's just imagine that for some reason, the Warriors get thrashed. The Knights are a really improved team and he only scores 15. Well, how do I get rid of him? There's all these Dragons above him. Well, what you'd do is you'd have to risk these two players scoring better than him, but at least you've avoided a bad score from him, say a 15. Now, if that didn't happen and Tamara Martin scored well, no Walsh to take away kick meters, has to play outside Sean Johnson, who's starting to get a little bit older, not at his best anymore. Say he scores a 30 or 35 and you're like, mm, I think that's good enough. You can then test the last pair with Sloan using Sonny Luke and Isaac Thompson. And you, I think probably of those four, Sonny Luke is the biggest risk to score really low, depending on his minute split with Kenny. Let's say he does, and he scores 10 in 15 minutes, a really poor score. Well, obviously, you would just sub Thompson up, and you would get Luke in your emergencies and all these other three good scores that you've already checked except for Thompson. Essentially, the earlier you sub in to get rid of a bad score, the more risk there is because you don't know those scores, but at least you have gotten rid of one potential bad score. And this year, with the buy rounds, players not locking until the end of the year, end of the round, sorry, you have a lot more opportunities to do that than other years where a red dot might be locked in after round seven. Say if you had Ben Trebojevic and he didn't play, then you wouldn't be able to do anything with guys like Isaac Thompson because you wouldn't be able to move around um, a Ben Trebojevic because he'd already be locked into place and you wouldn't be able to do any of the swaps. So guys, that's pretty much all I want to talk about for buy looping. You'll learn a lot and I'm pretty sure I'll learn a lot as we go through the year. 
in combination with some of the positional loops like Sloan, we might even be able to do something like Sloan here and two on the bench if you had three dragons to start the year to mix up and match all of the positions. But it'll be an experiment and it'll just be another way you can get maybe an extra five or ten points a week, maybe even more if you're a little bit lucky. Sometimes it'll backfire, sometimes that Isaac Thompson type player who plays last will score worse. You'll be a bit upset that you didn't just leave it there. But other times it'll work out really well and you'll, on average, I'd say you'd save yourself quite a lot of trouble and gain quite a lot of extra points by the end of the year because of the prominence of these buy players.